Good morning, church family. It is indeed a joy and a privilege to be here with you. Thank you so much to everyone who came last night. We had a wonderful time of fellowship, meeting and greeting and enjoying Anna's wonderful lemon cake that she made without knowing that it's one of my absolute favorites. So thank you. If you uh, have your Bible still handy, and I hope that you do, I hope you kept your thumb or finger there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That is where we will be. So please go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We will be focusing on verses 9 through 11 this morning. As you're doing that, I want to give you just a quick overview of where we are, where 1 Corinthians is, where we are in 1 Corinthians. The church in the city of Corinth was founded by the Apostle Paul and others on his second missionary journey. You can read about that in Acts chapter 18, if you're so inclined. Corinth was one of the largest cities in the ancient Roman world. It was a huge center for commerce, trade. It was strategically located, but as a result, it was also very, very corrupt. Traders and merchants, travelers and politicians could find any and every pleasure and vice there under the sun. And in the midst of it, Paul the Apostle, under the leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit, plants a church. And so the letter to the, to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians deals with their struggles. The church there was struggling to know how to live in that world, how to relate to the world around them as the people of God. Paul addresses so many issues in this letter, so many internal issues and arguments that they were having. Was it okay for them to indulge in any of these vices in the city? Should they adopt a position of uh, asceticism or retreat from the culture? What about ethics? What about sexual morality? What about lawsuits? He addresses issues of marriage and divorce, of eating and drinking, of spiritual gifts, cults of personality. He even addresses the historicity, the veracity of the resurrection, as Levi mentioned uh, last week. Do you think these sound familiar? Do you think these sound like issues that are still facing the church today? The people of God in Corinth didn't understand how they were to live because they didn't understand who they really were. They were having a crisis of identity. They were having a crisis of individual identity. And as a result of that, they were having a crisis of their corporate identity. Identity is a popular word and concept in our day and age, isn't it? Our world today is so focused almost obsessively on your identity. How do you self-identify? I know you've heard this before. The world gives us specific markers that they want us to identify by. Gender, sexuality is a big one. Ethnicity, social class, even your favorite movies or TV shows. You can be identified by your fandom, as it were. Some of these things are mutable, changeable. Some of these things are immutable and unchangeable. And frankly, our world today seems to be very confused about which is which. For those of you who are a little more philosophically minded, maybe you've heard of postmodernism. Some people say that this was an idea that peaked in the late 90s, but I think we're still seeing the fallout. Postmodernism is marked by deconstructing everything taking all the structures and stability markers of society and tearing them down. Everything becomes a tool of the patriarchy or oppression or racism, and everything therefore must be deconstructed and gotten rid of. Well, eventually, after you deconstruct the world around you, what's left to deconstruct? The self. And when you unmake yourself, then... The world says you have the right to remake yourself however you see fit. I think, therefore, I am. You unmake yourself. You remake yourself. Now you can even make up words to express how you self-identify. This worldly obsession with authenticity is related to our identity or your self-identity, as it's so popular to say nowadays. But I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, spoiler alert, there are only two possible identities for every man, woman, and child who has ever lived throughout all of history in any time or place throughout the world. There are only two ways to identify, and that's with sin or with Christ. There are no other options. There is no middle ground. 
There are only two identities. So let's look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's look at verses 9 through 10. I'll read this again. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. This is quite a list, isn't it? It's one thing I want to point out here, that this list of sins is not exhaustive. If you find an identity in a sin that is not listed, you're not off the hook. There are several lists of sins, quote-unquote, throughout the Bible. Uh, Mark chapter 7, Romans chapter 1, 2 Timothy 3. There's all throughout Scripture. You've probably heard this before. In Jesus' time, the Pharisees, who were experts in the Old Testament law, had identified no less than 613 individual commandments of Moses that the people of God were supposed to follow perfectly. One modern source regarding the New Testament has listed 124 individual sins. So you do the math. Have you kept all these 700 and some sins perfectly? But having these lists of sins, I think, reveals a a, a discrepancy in the way we tend to think about sin today. I think we tend to think about sins as keeping a list or following a list as opposed to sin and identity. Sins, plural, as a list, puts the emphasis on these lists, these lists of do's and don'ts. This is common to every other religion in the world. Do this, don't do that, and you'll be fine. Satisfy this list of requirements, and you will be accepted by God. But that's just moralism. That's not Christianity. Sin puts the emphasis on our identity. Our identity is sinful. Therefore, sins are actions that we do which reflect our internal reality, our identity. In other words, what we do reflects who we are. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. All throughout Scripture, the heart is used to represent the innermost being, the core of who we are. The book of Proverbs says, from the heart flow springs of life. But again, The book of Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Apart from Christ, our heart, our identity is sinful. So what is sin? Well, of course, the Westminster Shorter Catechism beautifully defines sin as any transgression of or want of conformity to God's law. With our children, we do a children's catechism, and we define sin is doing what God forbids, or not doing what God requires, which is just kind of a simpler way to say the exact same thing. God's law, the lists of do's and don'ts that he gives us, God's law is an expression of his character. And his character, he is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God says, be holy as I am holy. Jesus said, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In 1 John, the apostle writes, everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin reflects our identity. And our identity, apart from Christ, is contrary to God's character. There are only two identities, sin and Christ. Notice, too, the sense of these words in this list of sins. Adulterers, idolaters, thieves. These aren't people who steal or people who commit adultery. No, these are identities. This is a status. This is a category of person. People who are defined by their sin. Sin is still related to specific actions, But these actions stem from an internal state, an identity of sin, sinfulness. We are all sinners, even if we are in Christ, we are all sinners in the sense that we still transgress. We fail to conform perfectly to God's law, even after being saved. This is what the Apostle Paul talks about so passionately in Romans chapter 7 and 8. This is not the same thing, though, as having your identity be defined by the state of sin. David committed adultery. 
but he is not listed as an adulterer. David committed murder. He is not remembered as a murderer. He is remembered as a man after God's own heart. His identity was not in his sin, as heinous as it was. But people tend to rationalize themselves. We all tend to do this, don't we? You ask the, you watch any kind of man on the street interview about religion or God or heaven or the Bible, everyone says pretty much the same thing. I think I'm a pretty good person. I'm certainly not as bad as that guy over there. James, James chapter 2 says, whoever keeps the whole law but stumbles in one point is guilty of, the whole, of breaking the whole law. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, that especially sins like adultery and murder are not just matters of external actions, but matters of the heart, of the mind. No one is righteous. All have sinned and fallen short. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. And so this list in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, Paul is describing the world, the unrighteous. He is saying this list is not to describe saints, the redeemed, the people of God, those who are set to inherit the kingdom of God in the future tense. What Paul is saying is that if you live like this, if you find your identity in your sin, then you are not a member of the church. Even if you show up in the building, even if you have a card, if you live like this, then you are not one of God's people. As we read earlier, no one who claims to live in Christ and still intentionally and habitually and finds their identity in sins is in Christ. They are lying to themselves. Sin reflects identity. The world today tells us to find our identity in our sin. Most commonly regarding sexuality, but there are many others as well. Sexual sins, especially homosexuality, are explicitly tied to a conscious rejection of God, especially in Romans chapter 1, but also in the later part here of 1 Corinthians 6. This is one reason why they are focused on so heavily in several places throughout the Bible. Even in this relatively short list of sins, there are three sinful sexual identities listed in the English language. There's actually four in the Greek. There are two different words that are combined together to be translated homosexual offenders, or however your English translation may render that. It is very telling, I believe, that the world today has placed such a massive importance on expressing your authentic self, your authentic identity, primarily through sexuality. Because our world, beloved, is in open rebellion against God. And this is nothing new. This is nothing new. It's not unique to our time. And in a way, this mentality actually reflects, although it's twisted, it reflects a certain amount of understanding of the truth. Sin reflects our identity, and so sinful actions will naturally align with sinful identity. A sexual sin-related identity is the primary way, then, to express an identity as the member of the world's system, rebelling against its creator. They say, you're a sinner just like me, so act like it. Be yourself. Be authentic. This is in every Disney movie ever made. Follow your heart. Shakespeare, four, four or five hundred years ago, said, to thine own self be true. The world, in its own way, understands the correlation of our actions to our identity. But what they don't understand, what they cannot understand apart from the Holy Spirit is that we have a new identity. Look with me at verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. Beloved, this is a glorious glorious reality we were we were dead in our trespasses and sins but we're not anymore we have a new identity given to us and that identity is no less than jesus christ himself ephesians 2 4 says but god but god romans 6 paul says we are dead to sin and alive to god in christ jesus John chapter 5 says, We have passed out of death and into life. 
Our old self was crucified with Christ, so it is no longer I who live, says Paul again in Romans 6, but Christ who lives in me. If we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Paul is making a sharp distinction here, beloved, between the church and the world, between the righteous and the unrighteous. This is what he's talking about in chapter 6 as a whole. The first part of chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, the righteous are not to be judged by the unrighteous. We have a different identity. In verses 9 through 11 here, the righteous are fundamentally and intrinsically different than the unrighteous. We have a different identity. And then again in the next part, verses 12 through 20, we are not to be joined to the unrighteous. Our actions are grounded in our identity. Our new identity then changes how we live in the world and how we relate to the world. Let's break this down just a little bit. Washed. Paul says we have been washed. This, of course, is the language of baptism. But Paul's not talking here about the physical act of baptism, but rather what baptism itself refers to, its greater reality. Titus 3.5, Paul explicitly refers to the washing of regeneration. Baptism corresponds and represents the promise of Christ and regeneration given to us by the Holy Spirit. Regeneration means new life. This is the moment when the Holy Spirit raises us, vivifies us, when he makes our dead hearts live, when he takes our heart of stone and replaces it with the heart of flesh, by whose power we then respond in faith to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Baptism is the visible representation of us having died to the sinful self, crucified with Christ, buried with him, raised again to walk in newness of life. The promise that regeneration cannot fail to result in anything except the life of Christ, our new identity in Christ. We have been washed. We have been sanctified. The word sanctified means to be made holy. What does holy mean? Holy is other, set apart, pure, perfect. Holiness is the defining aspect of who God is in the fullness and beauty of his character. The Bible uses the term sanctified in a twofold sense throughout Scripture. There is an ongoing sense in that as after we are regenerated and we walk through the Christian life by faith, we become more and more like Christ as we live our lives until we are finally perfected and glorified in in eternity future. But there's also a, a finished sense, a past tense sense, where something or someone has been set apart from the world for God's purposes. We think of the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament. They were sanctified. They made sacrifices for sanctification and dedication. They had to dedicate the tabernacle. They had to dedicate the furniture in the tabernacle. They had to dedicate the clothes they wore. They had to dedicate their undergarments. They had to themselves be cleansed and sanctified. And it took the shedding of the blood of bulls and goats to do that. We are sanctified, set apart for God's purposes and for his glory. What does that mean? What are those purposes? Here are just a few. We are set apart and sanctified to walk in newness of life, Romans 6.4. We are sanctified to do good works, Ephesians 2.10. We are sanctified to spur one another on to do good works, Hebrews 10.24. We are sanctified to do the work of ministry and to build up the body, Ephesians 4.12. We are sanctified to proclaim the gospel, Romans 10, 14, and 15. We are sanctified and set apart to make disciples and teach them to obey our Lord Jesus Christ, that he himself said in Matthew chapter 28. Ultimately, we are sanctified to worship God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. Of course, again, the Westminster Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? It is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Our purpose in being sanctified is to worship him. God's purpose for us in sanctifying us is not for us to continue to live in unrighteousness. We have been sanctified, so we must continue to, if you will, be being sanctified. Our actions are determined by our identity. 
So we were washed, we were sanctified. Paul says we were justified. This means to be legally declared righteous. Of course, if you love studying the Reformation and history like I do, you're very familiar with the importance and the beauty of the concept of justification. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about what's known as the great exchange where on, on the cross our sins are imputed to Christ and his righteousness, his perfect obedience is imputed to us. The Reformation, Luther uh, had this wonderful little phrase, simul justus et peccator. Of course, theologians and pastors love Latin phrases, right? Simul justus et peccator means that at the same time, we are considered just in God's eyes, and yet we are a sinner in and of ourselves. The way we are at the same time just and a sinner is only by the grace and the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. We have been washed. We have been sanctified. We have been justified, not because of ourselves, but on the basis of Christ's mercy and God's grace alone. Notice also, These three words here, the past tense, a passive voice. These are things, beloved, that are done to us. These are not things that are done by us. Paul does not say, you fulfilled the law. You worked really hard. You eradicated those sinful desires and behaviors. You conformed yourself to God's law. Congratulations. No, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Beloved, the Bible gives us no dichotomy between the vengeful God of the Old Testament and the New Testament Jesus of love. That's a very common thing. You've probably heard that before. No. From eternity past, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit have been perfectly united in the plan of salvation. We've just come through Holy Week, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday, contemplating the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus. Beloved, this was always the plan. Always plan A. It was always God's plan to give sinful men and women from every tribe and nation and tongue, from every kind of sinful background, a new identity by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. From start to finish, beloved, salvation is all of God. We are saved by the grace of God, from the wrath of God, and to the glory of God alone. This is the beauty of the gospel. The power and grace of God unto salvation are infinitely greater than any sinful identity. Anyone, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, regardless of your sinful background, will be saved. There are only two kinds of people, two identities, sin or Christ. This is regardless of ethnicity, sex, social class, anything. There are those who are dead in sin, alive in Christ. Those in the first Adam and those in the second. Sin is common to all humanity. And so too, there is only one way of salvation. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one mediator between God and man. One advocate on behalf of sinful men and women before God the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. And beloved, this... This is how people from all ethnicities, social classes, men and women can come together and form the church, the body of Christ. Only the power of God, the power of the one who has life in himself, the power to bring men and women back from the dead, the great I am that I am can take people who were once sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, drunkards, swindlers, and have them live together in unity Because he gives us our new identity. His son, Jesus Christ. The hymn writer John Newton at the end of his life famously said, I know two things. I am a great sinner, but I serve a great savior. You can think also of the thief on the cross. A man, a murderer, a a, a robber. A one who was defined by his identity as a thief. Finally paying the earthly price for his sins who said, this man has done nothing wrong. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to him in return? This day you will be with me in paradise. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. We have a vertical identity. We have a horizontal identity. 
Our vertical identity, our relationship, our identity as defined by being given a new life, the life of Christ, that identity determines and enables our horizontal identity to live together as the body of Christ. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And the only way we can live in this world and rightly relate to this world is if we are sure, if we know that we have been given a new identity in Jesus Christ. Beloved, such were some of you. But you were washed. So let me ask you this. Where do you find your identity? The world wants us to believe that we have to find our identity in our sin. Beloved, again, there are only two options. You can be identified in your sin or identified with your life in Christ. Being identified by your sin is worldly, not godly. That's what the unrighteous do, not the righteous. If you are one of God's people, you can no longer be identified by your sin. You must be identified by Christ. The world cannot understand this apart from the Holy Spirit. Claiming God's identity while living like the world is false. That is a lie. Danger. Danger. If our sins define us, then we are still in our sin. More so, if you insist upon defining yourself by your sin and not by Jesus Christ, then there is serious reason to question your identity, to question whether you have been washed, sanctified, justified, to question whether you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Beloved, I pray that's not true of anyone in this room or watching this morning. Examine yourself. See if you are in the faith. Jesus said in Matthew 7, many will say to him on the last day, Lord, Lord, but he will say, depart, I never knew you. If your identity is not in Christ, beloved, do not wait. Don't wait. Acknowledge him, accept him, repent of your sinful identity, surrender yourself to him as Savior and Lord and be given his new identity today. Examine your heart, examine the fruit of your life. Make sure your identity is in Christ and then act like it. Start living and acting according to your new identity. Paul is saying here, strive for sanctification. It doesn't happen automatically. It doesn't happen on its own. We have to work. Paul, later in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 15, he says, I worked harder than anyone, and yet it was not me, but Christ working through me. We have been set free from the curse, from the identity of sin, even though we are not yet completely free from its influence its desire, or its earthly consequences. We all have sins that we must struggle against. We are to daily take up our cross and follow Christ. We are to crucify the sinful desires of the flesh. The Puritan theologian John Owen said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. We fight against sin until the day we die or until Christ returns. But if we are in Christ, then by the grace of God, beloved, that's not who we are anymore. Individually, we have been given a new individual identity, a new creation in Christ. And if so, then this is who we are corporately. We've given a new collective identity, the church, the called out ones, the body of Christ. Our corporate identity as the body of Christ is defined by each of our individual identities as the people of God in Jesus Christ. Our identity was in sin and death. Oh, beloved, by the grace and mercy of God, we have been given a new identity. Such were some of you. Where is your identity? Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us your word. I praise you that through Jesus, we can have our sinful identity removed and be given new life, a new identity, your identity. I pray that we would not take it for granted, but be diligent about knowing and ensuring that our identity is in Christ Jesus alone. May we be confident, not in ourselves, but in the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, that we may know how to live in this sinful world as the people of God, washed, sanctified, justified. May we look forward with eager anticipation to your return in the certain hope of inheriting your kingdom. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray and for his sake, amen.